Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining the Bridgeport Public Library. We're excited to have J.W. Oker talk about his new book, The United States of Cryptids. J.W. Oker is an Edgar Award winning travel writer, novelist, and blogger. His previous books include Poland, A Season with the Witch, and Cursed Objects. He is also the creator of the blog and podcast, Odd Things I've Seen, available at oddthingsiveseen.com where he chronicles his visits to oddities around the world. And um, we'll get to his presentation. Oh, uh, I'm just muted, sorry about that. Thanks, okay. Jeff. Let me share my screen, make sure it's working, and tell me if you're seeing my face in a serpent. Oh, yeah. All good? Awesome. Yep. Awesome. So thanks guys for coming. I appreciate you dropping by the Zoom chat on a, 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 a you know, weekday night. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about cryptids um, and my book, The United States of Cryptids, but I want to do it a little bit of a different way than I often do it. And that's to take you kind of behind the scenes on what I learned writing this book, uh, including, you know, what a cryptid is and why I kind of um, wrapped it around the United States. So I'll go ahead and dive right into that and talk about what a cryptid is, because it's a very messy term. I talked to a lot of people uh, with this book. And not everybody knew what a cryptid was. You know, a lot of times people reach for Bitcoin cryptocurrency uh, terminology, but uh, no, cryptid isn't really that mainstream a term, which is surprising to me. Um, however, uh, the definition of a cryptid is pretty straightforward, at least with words, right? It's an animal that is claimed but not proven to exist. Now, this generally just means there's no first evidence, right? There's, there's maybe uh, eyewitness, maybe there is photography, videography of a creature. But the mainstream scientific establishment has not acknowledged it exists because they need a body, much like, you know, uh, murder investigation needs a body. Cru uh, scientists need an animal body to say, hey, this thing exists. Happened with gorillas. Once upon a time, most of the world didn't know about, the, about gorillas or they knew them only as legends of these dark, furry monsters uh, out in the jungle uh, until somebody brought a gorilla carcass <laughs> into, into the rest of the world and said, hey, look, it's a real creature. It's not this, you know, legendary monster. Uh, similarly with uh, the platypus out in Australia, right? Um, nobody believed that thing exists until somebody, actually, they brought taxidermied specimens of the platypus out into Europe, and they held them in their hands and said, this isn't a real animal. There's zero chance this is a real animal. You took a duck's bill and you grafted it onto a beaver's body. That's all this is. So they actually had to export live platypuses before science was like, okay, those things, they're weird, but they exist. So that's generally what cryptids are. They haven't been proven to exist yet. No bodies. And then cryptozoology and cryptozoologists who study cryptozoology are generally studying, obviously not bodies, they're studying tales and they're interviewing eyewitness accounts and they're researching uh, evidence and locations and all these things that are kind of secondary evidence. Um, however, despite the fact that I just said that not a lot of people recognize the word cryptid when I talk to them, every single person recognized when I said, well, do you know about Bigfoot? Do you know about lake monsters? We all know these, right? We know <laughs> these are like uh, almost cultural icons like Mickey Mouse and Superman. People know what these things are. Um, and generally, traditionally, historically, cryptozoology covered what I would call um, possible biological entities, right? And that's like lake monsters and like Bigfoot. So Bigfoot is just a giant hairy hominid, right? And we know hairy hominids exist because right now we're in a Zoom chat full of hairy hominids. Uh, they just exist. So imagining a slightly bigger one who's lost in the woods isn't really hard for us. That doesn't tax our imagination. Uh, similar with anything in the ocean, anything in water, we don't, know, we don't know all that's down there, right? It's a gigantic <laughs> gigantic surface of stuff that we can't breathe in. So there's all kinds of stuff down there we don't know about. So pretty plausible. And traditionally, this is what cryptozoologists study. However, pop culture got their hands around the idea of cryptozoology and wasn't satisfied with just hairy hominids and lake monsters. They wanted lots more creatures in their encyclopedia, in their zoo. Um, so they, the um, definition has been expanded over the years to include other things besides stuff like this, right? Um, that definition is expanded to include myths. Well, this is a depiction of a Wendigo. These, all, most of the illustrations in today's presentation are by a man named Derek Quinlan, who illustrated the book. And his, his illustrations are worth buying the book by itself. You don't need the words, you just need the illustrations. But this is a, his take on a Wendigo, which is a myth of Native American peoples in Northern United States, what is now the Northern United States and Canada, basically very cold places, had this very complicated myth around this idea that if you didn't store up food for the winter and you ran out, you might go cannibal, right? That's a very plausible scenario. And that real life scenario is mixed with the idea of spirits and myths and stories and cautionary tales. And again, a very complicated concept that when it traveled across cultures, you know, uh, you know, modern settler culture, 
we just turn it into a monster. We're like, oh, it's a monster. Put it in our cryptid encyclopedias. So it's the uh, definition of cryptid is expanded to include mythological legendary creatures. It's also expanded to include aliens, right? So aliens are, this is the Pascaluga elephant man from Pascaluga, Mississippi. Basically the story is a craft, an alien craft lands behind a couple of fishermen. These three uh, very robotic floating entities come out of it. They grab the fishermen, they pull them back inside the craft for, you know, the irony of, uh, you know, an intergalactic catch and release program on fishermen. So anyway, aliens are now in cryptozoology mostly because, um, you know, the, the scientific establishment acknowledges the plausibility of extraterrestrial life for sure, uh, outside somewhere, somewhere beyond, in the great beyond. But the ones that have visited the earth, you know, we have no bodies. Roswell aside, we have no bodies. Uh, so any kind of idea of a biological entity from outer space that has, you know, been seen, been, uh, has been witnessed um, is not in the realm of science. So it's in the realm of cryptozoology. Even stranger, uh, I mentioned these things are metallic and floating. These are alien robots. The Pascaluga elephant men are robots, according to the witnesses and according to the witnesses who were taken inside the craft and said actual biological entities are in there. So alien robots are cryptids. In fact, it's, this isn't the only alien robot I'm going to show you tonight. I have another one coming up here in a little bit. And then finally, the third kind of creature in there, besides you know myths, besides aliens, besides alien robots, besides plausible biological entities, are sentient creatures. Um, this is a Pukwudgie, mostly known Massachusetts, a little bit in the Midwest. It's like typical elf fairy, things that are sentient, but also magical. Um, and you can tell the puck what he is sentient because he carries a weapon and he's ashamed of his genitalia, like all, you know, good sentient people are. Um, but this is known as a magical creature, right? It can turn invisible. It can cloud the minds of mortals and lead them over cliffs to their deaths, generally, generally their MO. But again, it's a story about a creature that science doesn't acknowledge as existing. So that a lot of times get lumps into cryptozoology. And in fact, it goes even further than that. It, it, you know, the idea might be that a Pukwudgie might be based on an actual creature that's not you know, invisible and magic powers. It's just a creature that looks like this. So again, a wide definition, it's a messy term. Uh, but in the end, I think all we're doing really uh, as, as crypt, cryptid fans is we love monsters. We love different varieties, shapes. It's like it's Pokemon, right? We got to collect, collect them all or catch them all, uh, including this one, which is a chicken rooster octopus creature called the Snallygaster, who's known to haunt Western Maryland. Or at least he was before he died in a giant mash of um, um, uh, boiling hot moonshine, uh, according to the story. So we just love monsters. We love the variety of them. And generally, I'm, I'm with that, right? So my book uh, has more than 70 different creatures. I didn't want it to be just Bigfoot. Didn't want it to be the United States of Bigfoot. I wanted lots of variety, the avian, the Piscean, the reptilian, anything I could put in there. So, you know, I totally, I totally get this. I love this as well. So generally, that's what a cryptid is, messy term. But it, because it's so messy, that makes it a lot of fun. It allows us to tell a lot more stories about a lot more weird creatures. So that's the cryptid part of my, the, my book title, The United States of Cryptid. What about the United States part, right? So the strangest thing I learned in a book full of snallygasters and metallic robot aliens and, and, and you know, Bigfoot is that they're celebrated by entire towns. And this is really the point of the book. It's, this is definitely an encyclopedia of monsters, but it's also a travel guide to places. Um, and, I, and I joke in the introduction that uh, this is the only book in the history of cryptozoology, um, thousands and thousands of books, to guarantee you'll find a cryptid. And that's because of the celebration aspect, this travel log aspect. Over the course of this book, I found 40 different cryptid statues. Now, what I mean by cryptid statues is not, you know, mass marketed things you buy off novelty stores. Not that. I mean, actual civic sculptures placed prominently in towns, in front of the historical society, in front of the courthouse, in front of major parks, right downtown, um, including this one. This is <laughs> this is the Gloucester Sea Serpent of Gloucester, Massachusetts. It is the most well-documented cryptid in North America. It was sighted for <laughs> two years off the coast of Cape Ann, swimming around. It was studied by scientists. It was attacked and tried captured by the uh, attempts at capture by sailors. It was just ogled by tourists and we never caught it. But it was out there for two years, just kind of swimming around. And today, if you go downtown Gloucester, right in front of the Historical Society, in this spot where you assume to be a statue of a pilgrim or a settler, maybe even another Gloucester fisherman, is this giant, you know, 12, 13, 14 foot long effigy of the Gloucester sea serpent. Uh, and these are all over the country. This is not a strange thing for somebody to do. This is all over the country that we're celebrating Monsters, monsters from the histories of our towns uh, across the country. But we're doing more than erecting statues. We're also erecting museums. I counted at least 18 cryptid museums over the course of, of this book. Um, these things, they come, into, they come into existence probably 
you know, monthly and then also shut down monthly, but there's about 18 at the time I was doing the book, including this one. This is the Monster Mark in Folk, Arkansas. This celebrates, this is a museum and also a convenience store because you want to stop by and get some, some beef jerky or whatever. It celebrates a particular type of Bigfoot, a Bigfoot called the Folk Monster. Folk Monster came out in, or um, was spotted in 1971, Folk, Arkansas. And it became famous, not just because it was Bigfoot. It became famous because a year later, a, uh, a enterprising director and writer made a movie about it called The Beast of Boggy Creek. And that movie went on to become kind of a cult hit in the horror genre. It felt like a documentary. It's very raw. It used locals in the filming. It used, used actual locations in folk. Um, and generally just raised the profile of this, of this Bigfoot pretty high, enough that it gets its own museum, the Monster Mart. Um, this is a good example of why they do it, right? There's zero reason for anybody in this Zoom chat to, uh, to ever, 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 ever go to Folk Arkansas. There's just not, there's not. You, you, to get there, you have to really plan. It's in the middle of nowhere. Unless you're born there, there's no reason to go there unless you want to go see the Folk Monster Mart, which is why I went. So um, that's the whole purpose is to draw people in with these statues, with these museums, to places you probably would never go otherwise. But they're doing more than you know erecting statues and, and opening museums. They're throwing parties, annual parties, 24 cryptid festivals, I counted uh, over, the, over the course of this book, including this one, Turtle Days in Churubusco, Indiana, which I know you're already thinking in your head, like, wait, turtles, science acknowledges the existence of turtles, right? It, they, they, we have bodies, we have shells, we know that turtles exist. And that's true, that's true. Uh, but Churubusco isn't celebrating turtles in general. Uh, by Turtle Days, they're celebrating one turtle the size of a dining room table that was spotted in a pond outside of town in 1958. Uh, this spotting kicked off about four to five months of actual town hysteria where, you know, newspaper stories were written about it um, in the national news and in the international news. All the local restaurants were serving turtle soup. They dredged the pond trying to find this turtle. They dropped in sea turtles trying to lure it out. They sent divers in. The farmer who owned the pond actually almost went bankrupt because he was trying so hard to find this gigantic turtle that he forgot to farm. Worked out for him because the next year he sold his farm as the Beast of Busco farm. Uh, the turtle was called Oscar, but also called the Beast of Busco. Uh, and he did all right. He was fine. Never found the turtle again. But here we are 60 years later, the town of Churubusco is celebrating that one moment in their history for decades. Um, and it's awesome. I love this. What I really love about this is a lot of towns do this. They kind of theme their town according to their monster, a monster from their history. And why I think this is brilliant is because all these towns, especially these days, they really survive off tourism. Um, they want to bring you to them. And again, probably not a reason for you to ever to go to Churubusco other than if you're into, into monsters. But they try to find a unique differentiator, you know, to speak in marketing terms. And these days, there's really only three ways, that three things towns have, right? Or regions have, even cities have. One is sports teams, right? You see a Boston Bruins hat, you're like, okay, this person's from New England or has some connection to New England. And that's generally what we use. Every major city is represented by its sports teams. Um, and if you're not into sports, it's too bad you know, that you're still kind of pegged <laughs> in, that, in that kind of identity. If you don't have a sports team, if you're a small town, you're from a you know, college town or whatever, then another, another option is history, right? But we all kind of have the same history in the U.S., from the settler side at least. You know, it's, it's world wars, it's, it's civil war, it's settlers, it's, it's, it's founders. We all have the same statues in the middle of town. So there's not really a big differentiator for most cities around their history, unless you're like Gettysburg or something like that. And then the, one, the final thing that most towns fall on is ge geographical features, you know, come see our mountains, our farms, our coastline, come see our ponds or whatever. And again, everybody has that. So there's no reason to go to Churubusco to see its farmland because there's a million towns offering their farmland. But if you have a gigantic turtle <laughs> that was in your history and only you can claim that, you can run with that and have a unique spot. If you want to learn about the giant, you know, giant piece of Busco, you have to go to Churubusco. You can't go anywhere else. So I love this. I love this identity, grabbing this identity in, from this strange, unique thing from your history. All right, so that's kind of the that's kind of the story in the book, really, the the cryptid part, the United States part. Uh, but I learned a few other things uh, in doing this book and creating and traveling to this book, researching to this book. One is that Bigfoot is big, and I mean that in an annoying way. This guy was an absolute thorn in my side as I tried to research this book. Like I said, I was trying to get a lot of creatures in this book. I have over seventy. I didn't want it to be the United States of Bigfoot. But everywhere I went, I had to like pass through this giant, you know, just curtain of fur to get to other to get to other creatures. And that, there's a few reasons for that. Mostly, every single state in the United States has had a Bigfoot sighting. That includes tiny old Delaware. That includes tiny Rhode Island. That includes Hawaii, out in the middle of the ocean, has had giant furry primate sightings. So it's everywhere, um, and people love it. It's a cultural icon, like I said earlier in the, in the presentation. 
For example, remember I said 40 statues of cryptids across this, this country of ours? I would say probably half of them are of Bigfoot. Here's a quick selection, right? There's this the up in the upper corner. That concrete one is the largest statue in the country. It's made of concrete. It's out in Washington State. Beside that is Virginia. That's the Woodburger. Is <laughs> how they call it, Bigfoot in Virginia. Beside that, the chainsaw Bigfoot. This is the largest chainsaw sculpture of Bigfoot in the country. It's in South Dakota. It would be the largest statue of all of them if it stood up off its big butt and stood on its big feet instead. But it's out there in South Dakota. Below that, uh, Northern California, China Flats. That's their statue, um, which. They probably had the best claim to it because Bigfoot started in Northern California, uh, spotted in the late 50s, the first evidence, the first site, the first naming of it as Bigfoot was in the late 1950s in uh, Northern California, but not in North Carolina, which is the next one beside it, Bigfoot Trails. There's no reason for North Carolina to really jump on that <laughs> train. And then beside that, good old Gasquatch, right? I learned a lot of cool terms in this book, you know, Snally Gaster, Snarly Yow, but Gasquatch might be my favorite. Gasquatch is a gas station in, in Oklahoma. Um, again, another kind of not state you just, you assigned to Bigfoot, uh, but it's a giant convenience store, Bigfoot themed. It's got murals, it's got a gigantic uh, cage suspended from the ceiling with a, um, a reward offered for anybody that fills it with a Bigfoot. This Gasquatch sign is like 32, 33, maybe 35 feet tall. And it would be the largest statue <laughs> in the country if it wasn't not a statue, if it was just a sign. Uh, but I'm glad it exists. Uh, again, the, probably the largest one above it, the concrete one, I think is 32 feet tall. So there you go, Bigfoot is just everywhere. And I'm gonna give you an even better example of why Bigfoot was a problem for me, you know, almost an invasive species, if you wanna to, want to think of it that way. Um, I'm gonna use this example, right? This is, what you're seeing there is a monster called the Flatwoods monster, also called the Green monster, also called the Braxton County monster. This is um, one of those situations where for some reason, the journalists who first wrote about this monster didn't decide on a really cool name. They just kind of called it that and no name stuck. It's just what happens. Usually the, the journalists, the first writes about it gets to name it. That's what happened with Bigfoot. That's what happened with Mothman. But nobody did that with the green monster. Um, but this is in Flatwoods, West Virginia. Uh, this is what I call, uh, it's a very unique monster. As you can already tell, it's a very unique shaped monster. This is what I call kind of a one night stand cryptid or one night only cryptid. Uh, only, it, only one sighting, one night. Uh, it was late 50s, a uh, be, uh, thing in the sky kind of arced over the sky, light in the sky. A bunch of kids on the ground saw it. Saw it seemingly land on a hill in the distance. They went home, got their mom, got their dog, and they all tramped out to this hill to see what it was that just hit this hill. And they came across what you're seeing in front of you, a 10 foot tall, gleaming, smelly monster floating toward them. Uh, one witness described it as Frankenstein with B.O. And it is our other alien robot that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it was all metal. It floated. Uh, it, its dress was even metal. But you know, it's a one, it's a very unique creature though. Only, only Flatwoods can talk about the Flatwoods monster. Uh, and they, they do a really good job of capitalizing on it, right? Some of these pictures are from their Flatwoods Museum. They have a Flatwoods Monster Museum, I should say. There's a monster museum right downtown. Um, they have these chairs everywhere that I'm sitting in here. They have the requisite signage. These, these um, ceramic lanterns are in every single store, every single convenience store in the area, in the county. Uh, the spot is a restaurant and they just put a photo op out there. So they're doing a really great job of capitalizing on this very unique part of their history that nobody else has, right? Again, I keep saying this, but you will never, ever, 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 ever go to Flatwoods on purpose unless you're into monsters, which is again, why I went and why I spent my tourist dollars. But despite having this unique monster that nobody else has, and despite capitalizing on it really well, there's still Bigfoot. About last year, about a block from the Flatwoods Monster Museum, they opened up the West Virginia Bigfoot Museum. So even though they had this unique differentiator, they still had to open up a Bigfoot Museum because again, Bigfoot is an invasive species. And th this bothered me, it kind of bothered me. I'm playing this a little bit funny, but it, it bothered me a little bit that I kept having to like throw down Bigfoot stories just so I could get to other stories. So I decided to figure out why. Uh, I went to the expert. His name is Lauren Coleman. He runs the International Cryptozoology Museum in Port, uh, uh, Portland, Maine. Um, and he's been the face of cryptozoology for decades, uh, probably 60 years. Um, he's been the face of it. If there's a documentary about cryptids, he's in it. If there's a book about cryptids, he's in it. He's in my book. He's everywhere. Um, he really has popularized it for modern times. He was one of the, one of the main popularizers. He was first on scene on, on a, quite a few of the uh, more, more famous cryptids, the Dover Demon in Dover, Massachusetts, for instance. So he is legit. He's the, he's, he's the, the face of cryptozoology. So I went to him, uh, I've known him for a few years, and I said, you know, went to his museum and talked to him and said, you know, Lauren, why Bigfoot? He's huge, right? Is, am, I just, am I just missing this? He's definitely huge. And Lauren told me, yeah, like anybody that comes into the museum, he asks, who's your favorite cryptid? And he said, 99% of the time, they say Bigfoot. And he said, when he was a kid, so uh, again, Bigfoot came out, Bigfoot became an entity in the late 1950s. 
and Lauren predates that. And he said when he was a kid, the two biggest cryptids were the Loch Ness Monster and the Yeti out there in, in, the, in Tibet and in the Himalayas. He said those are the two big monsters. Those are, those are your favorite cryptids. But obviously they were the width of the ocean away, the width of the world away. They were very exotic, very far away. They were, um, to, to go find them, you literally had to be rich and put together an expedition and know how to climb mountains and know how to, how to like use sonar for, for bodies of water. You had to really know what you're doing. Um, he said, but, you know, once Bigfoot became big and seen in every state, all you had to do to look for Bigfoot was walk into your local woods and you were technically Bigfoot hunting. So I said, I get it. I get it. So what you're saying is, you know, Bigfoot is accessible. And that's why we all are obsessed with Bigfoot. He's like, well, not really. He's like, that's a reason, but it's not the main reason. He said, the main reason that we love Bigfoot so much in this country is that we're all narcissists, right? Bigfoot just reminds us that he's bipedal, he's furry, he has a human, human face more often than not. Uh, it just reminds us of us more than a reptilian creature, a Piscean creature, an avian creature. We just see ourselves in Bigfoot. And of course, you know, we had this, this flaw born out of evolution or whatever happened where we are attracted and drawn to people, things that look like us, right? It's the source of prejudice and bias and racism and narcissism. It's the source of all these bad things. And that's why we like Bigfoot because we're technically <laughs> we're sort of bad people. Um, I love this. I love this answer though. It makes so much sense to me. And obviously, Lauren arrived at this answer through decades of research and thinking about it and obsessing about it and, and just staring at Bigfoot statues all day. Um, but what really, what really convinced me wasn't Lauren so much, um, but Harry and the Hendersons. So <laughs> Harry and the Hendersons is a 1980s family-friendly comedy about a family that hits a Bigfoot out on vacation one day and they take him home and he becomes part of the family. He's cuddly, look at the mom, cuddling up into his fur. He's funny, he has, a, he has emotions, he has expressions, a sense of humor. They love him. He's part of the family, right? Um, which illustrates the idea of we don't want to find Bigfoot because we're curious if he's out there. We just want him to be our friend. We want to be friends with Bigfoot is what we really want, not put him in a, put him in a zoo. But this movie only works with Bigfoot. Uh, that's kind of what convinced me that we are narcissists when it comes to Bigfoot. If this movie were, say, um, the Lizard Man Escape or Swamp in the Hendersons, or the Lizard Man in the Hendersons, it, wouldn't work. it would be a totally different movie. Or if it was the Enfield Horror in the Hendersons, Totally different movie. Enfield Horror is a monster out of Illinois. Uh, totally different movie. It could only be a, this family-friendly comedy of this cuddly uh, outcast, um, you know, in, in a family is Harry. It could only be Harry. It couldn't be anybody else. Um, so that is, that's Bigfoot. That's how I kind of finally came to terms with Bigfoot is realizing that we're all just narcissists or learning that we're all just narcissists. And that's why I had such a trouble finding other monster, monster stories uh, besides Bigfoot sometimes. All right, so where can I get away from all the Bigfoot? Who has the most interesting monsters? Who is celebrating the, the monsters the best? What, what states are? Ohio's good at it. West Virginia is good at it. Uh, probably the best of all of them, and this might be a surprise, is Wisconsin. They do a great job. They have a wide variety of monsters, and they do a great job. They have Bigfoot, of course, like everybody. They have lake monsters, like everybody. But then they have this random assortment of the Hodag. The Hodag is a leopard-sized creature with spikes on its back, a lumberjack tail from the 19th century that they have adopted as the symbol and soul of Rhinelander, Wisconsin. You go to the, the tourist office, there's a giant statue, which is the picture there in front of it. They sell merchandise in all the stores around Christmas time. It all becomes like Ho-Ho Hodag merchandise. Um, they have um, a Hodag days every year. They really embrace this thorny creature really tightly, and it's become their Thing. Their entire thing, the entire reason to go to Rhinelander is to see the Hodag. Um, if you go to their website, the municipal website, you know, where you go to pay, go to pay bills or learn about tourism there, it's basically a Hodag fan site with video games and like a club you can join. They love the Hodag. Below them, Mount Horeb, they're as obsessed with trolls as, Rhin, as Rhinelander is with the Hodag. Their main street is called the Trollway. Uh, it's advertised on all the signs outside of town on the highway. And you go down there, and it's got scores of statues of trolls just lining the entire street four feet tall, 10 feet tall, various dresses, various poses, all to bring people in to see a town you might not come to otherwise. Across from that, the Beast of Bray Road, there's a, there's a road in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, uh, Bray Road, which is notorious for the werewolf sightings along it, the dog men, the wolf men, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call them. But basically it's werewolves. And the entire town went crazy for werewolves from the 80s for a while there. Even today, people go to the street to see it. There's statues set up so people can have a photo op while they're looking for werewolves on Bray Road. And then above it, the Rhinolapis is a town whose name I always forget. It's right beside Rhinelander, though. And this is what I call a metacryptid. The Rhinolapis, which looks like H.R. Geiger did, or H.R. Jigger did a version of Gumby, is 
not a story. There's no story behind it. It wasn't a tale. Nobody had a sighting of this creature and they made a statue of it. Uh, a, guy, a restaurateur one day went down the swamp and found this giant, you know, 15 foot long, 10 foot tall tangle of roots, pulled it out and thought it looked vaguely monstrous. So he painted it and called it the rhinolopus, which is a combination of rhinoceros, elephant and octopus, because that's what he thought it was. And he set it out in front of his, in front of his restaurant for decades. And this is a tiny little town, tiny little map scene of a town. And then finally the restaurant got sold and part of it got torn down. The people took this statue and just put it in the town park. So now it's like their symbol of their town, this monster. Uh, again, um, why not? Why not do that? There's, for lack of any other reasons, you can, I, will, I would go to this town to see this statue in the park. All right, let's talk some Hollywood stuff now. Um, Hollywood might have a lot to do with cryptids, both being inspiration for some cryptids and being inspired by cryptids. Uh, I'll show you what I mean. So some of these stories will tend to be on the skeptical side, some aren't, um, but this is a good mix here. What you're looking at here is the Wolf Woman of Mobile, Alabama. But one side is the uh, actual illustration in the papers when it was first reported in Mobile. Um, uh, that's another way, you know, just like the journalist should name it right away, the illustrator that first illustrates it pretty much gives the creature its form, whether it's an illustrator for the newspaper or sometimes the eyewitness sketches it as well. But in this case, it was an illustrator in the newspaper did that version of the, the Wolf Woman. This other one is by Derek for my book. Um, and this is another kind of a non-story. Uh, one night in 1971 in Mobile, uh, the local authorities got flooded with calls of a wolf with a woman's face, possibly a woman's torso, wandering around the streets of Mobile. And, you know, they, they get these calls for a few nights. There were some jokes in the newspaper, and then she disappeared, right? Most cryptid stories end with, and they were never seen again. Um, why was there a Wolf Woman in Mobile, Alabama in 1971? Who knows? Maybe, maybe she was just there, or maybe it had to do with Hollywood. See, that same year, uh, 1971, a movie called The Mephisto Waltz came out, starring Alan Alda. This is a very trippy movie, very possession-oriented movie, very much Rosemary's Babies, kind of, but uh, a little bit more intense than that. Very trippy, early 70s. Um, but that movie came out later in the year, like after the, the Wolf Woman of Mobile sightings. However, its trailer was playing before the sightings. And this trailer is very trippy, very 70s, and features a three second clip of a very well-dressed woman walking through a party with a dog on a leash who has a human face. And so very striking, something you won't forget <laughs> once you see it, especially if you see it walking around, if you watch the, the trailer on YouTube, it's very, very much gonna stick with you forever. So if you do see a rustling in the hedgerow uh, later on that night, maybe you'll think you'll see a wolf with a human head. So that's a possibility. Um, obviously the wolf woman is a very obscure cryptid. Uh, so it's, it might be cherry picking cases a bit, what if I told you the same situation might be true of one of the most famous cryptids of all time, the Loch Ness Monster? Now, Loch Ness Monster is a bit out of my jurisdiction, right, naturally. However, um, it's got a valid point. So the, so the Loch Ness Monster, the first time it was seen in, in, in its you know, famous form as a long-necked pleosaur was um, 1933, believe it or not, that, that, late, that late in the calendar, right, that late in the, um, the timeline. 1933, it was a couple driving around the loch in the newfangled automobile um vacationing and just saw Nessie for the first time as a dinosaur turns out that same year was the year King Kong came out 1933 both in the UK and the US King Kong came out and obviously King Kong is about a giant ape and it was a big deal the King Kong changed people's perspectives of, of what movie could do of what reality was almost it was this was a, today it's a quaint movie but man back then it was it had a huge impact but obviously it's a giant ape um but in the beginning of the movie, as you'll recall, uh, there's like a lost world origin story where Kong, Kong is on Skull Island surrounded by dinosaurs. And there's a scene on the left, these are screen grabs right from King Kong of a long neck brontosaurian creature swimming around and attacking boats. It's Nessie. However, the first sighting of Nessie in this form by this couple was not in the water. They saw it just wandering through the brush. And a similar scene to that was also in King Kong. So maybe, maybe, this guy was so impacted by King Kong that he, or by the effects of King Kong, that he conflated something he saw with the dinosaur that would go on to become one of the most beloved cryptids of all time. So that's two bon mots I've given you for your cocktail party. Next time you're at that and you want to bring up cryptids. One is, we all love Bigfoot because we're narcissists. And two is, without King Kong, we might not have the Loch Ness Monster at all. All right, so those are skeptical origin stories. Let's get out of the skeptical for a bit and talk about this, uh, the coelacanth. Um, the coelacant is a fish uh, that for the entirety of human history, we thought was extinct, right? So the, 
50 million years ago is when coelacanths were supposed to have gone extinct. So their timeline and our timeline never crossed. We only have we only had fossils of the fish. Um, and that is until 1938, when a woman by the name of Courtney Latimer finds one. Um, I think she found one at a fish market in, in South Africa. And then soon after that, they actually caught one. But this fish is giant. This isn't a tiny fish that just escaped our notice. This thing is like five, six feet long. Its limbs look like, or its fins look like limbs. It's almost very missing linkish. Um, and it shocked the world. It's like, oh, this creature that we thought has been extinct before humans even existed actually has been there all this time. We just didn't know, or most of us didn't know. Somebody knew probably, but most of us didn't know. And it kind of shocked the world that, you know, that size of a creature could go undetected. And this is actually a cryptid story, a cryptid success story, because remember the definition of cryptid is an animal that has been, uh, that doesn't exist, that hasn't been proven to exist. And in this case, it's an animal that has not been proven to exist anymore. So that, that's still a cryptid. It's still a cryptid. It's like if you see um, the Tasmanian wolf, which has been extinct for decades, uh, but some people still think it exists, that's a cryptid. Uh, American lions, American kangaroos, uh, there's like there's evidence for them in the fossil record, but they don't exist anymore. But if you were to find a kangaroo wandering in America and it wasn't an escaped uh, zoo animal, uh, that's a cryptid. But in this case, they found the cryptid. It became not a cryptid anymore. And that's kind of the curse of cryptozoology. And the curse of being a cryptozoologist is if, this animal that you study your entire life and want to prove it exists, the second it exists, it doesn't belong to you anymore. It goes to biology and zoology, in the case of Bigfoot, maybe even anthropology. So suddenly this, your life's work is taken right from you and given to quote unquote legitimate sciences. So it's kind of sad being a cryptozoologist and you kind of almost never want to find the creature you're chasing uh, because of that. But anyway, back to Hollywood. Uh, the coelacanth uh, was big news, right? And it inspired a couple of writers who were like, huh, that's amazing that this creature has gone undetected for the entirety of human history. And it's big and it's in the water. What else is out there that we're just, we just don't know about that we did, is, is undetected? And what could it be? And what kind of story can we wrap around that? And they were eventually inspired to write a screenplay that got turned into, oh, sorry, uh, before I do that dramatic unveil, uh, the coelacanth is such a big cryptid story that the ICM actually uses it as their logo. Above Bigfoot, above Loch Ness Monster, the coelacanth is its logo. So just to kind of show you how important that kind of story is to cryptozoology. But anyway, those writers inspired by the coelacanth would go on to write the screenplay for The Creature from the Black Lagoon, right? One of the most important monsters of all time in, in cinema. Uh, one of the most iconic for sure. It came out in 1955. So what was that uh, 17 years after, uh, probably what, no, 17 years after, uh, not, don't make me do math, live. <laughs> a set of years after the coelacanth was found and determined to be a living, thriving population. Um, and then, of course, uh, <laughs> Gilman, the creature of the Black Lagoon, would go on to inspire a cryptid, the Loveland Frogman of Loveland, Ohio, which was spotted in the mid-1950s around the time that the creature from the Black Lagoon, another amphibious uh, biped, came out. So it's a, it's a beautiful circle of inspiring and being inspired in the world of cryptozoology. All right, one final story in Hollywood. This is a heartwarming one. Um, sorry, if James Stewart involved, it's probably heartwarming. Uh, Jimmy Stewart is not a cryptozoologist, never was. I don't know if he was ever interested in cryptids. We do know he never did a monster movie, really. For some reason, the guy never did a horror movie, never did a monster movie. Closest he got was probably Harvey, which is this six foot tall, invisible rabbit that he saw only when he was drinking. Uh, but if there, is a, if there was a you know, hall of fame for cryptozoologists, he would be in it because of these things. This is a, touted to be a mummified skull and mummified hand of a Yeti um, out in the Pingbosh Monastery in Tibet. It's there, it's there right now to this day. It's been there for centuries. And they've just claimed it's, a, it's mummified remains of a Yeti. Well, um, a man named Tom Slick, an oil baron, believe it or not, a wealthy oil baron named Tom Slick, decided he wanted to test it, to test this, 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 D, to test this DNA and see if it was actually Yeti in origin. So he funded an expedition to go out to uh, Nepal, out to Tibet, out to Pangbush, and find a way to get a sample. And they found a way. They got an entire finger off his hand. Uh, whether they stole it, bartered it, replaced it with another finger is a little bit vague, probably stole it, but they had this finger. Now, the problem is they had this mummified finger, but um, how do you get it back to the UK to the scientist who wants to test it? You have to go through customs and going through customs with a human-like finger is not a great idea. That's the way to get stopped and get your stuff confiscated. So Tom Flick said, hey, I have a friend. He's vacationing in Calcutta. Um, why don't you just take, take the hand down there and he will, he will smuggle it for you. So the team... Took, the, took it across India, across the um, country line into India, because that was easy. It's porous land border. Stick it in your pack, backpack, get it over there. And they met this guy in the lobby of his hotel, the Grand Hotel in Calcutta. And it was Jimmy Stewart. And they said, Jimmy Stewart, can you do us a favor? Can you smuggle this bone, this mummified finger, into the UK so we can test it to see if it's a Yeti? <laughs> and he was like, sure, <laughs> I'll totally do that. 
So he did it because here's the thing. Nobody's going to frisk Jimmy Stewart. He's just, he's an international movie star. He's living the grand life. He's not going to, he's not going to hurt that life by smuggling contraband or being a terrorist. He's not that guy. He's a famous movie star. So he took the, he took the finger bone, but just to make sure he hid it in his wife's lingerie case. Cause you're not going to frisk Jimmy Stewart. You're definitely not going to frisk his wife. And you're surely not going to poke around in her unmentionables. So he hid it in his lingerie case. This is now a caper, right? He's going to smuggle this Yeti finger into the UK to get tested. Which he did. It wasn't much of a caper because it came off without a hitch. Nobody, nobody frisked anybody. Nobody found this finger, and it made its way to the scientists who tested it. And mostly came up with inconclusive results. And then the finger disappeared. It almost like a cryptid itself. The finger disappeared until it was found in 2008 in a box of his belongings. Decades after his death, they found this finger, tested it with 2008 um, technology, and determined to be a human finger. Unfortunately. But it wasn't just an ordinary human finger. This is the human finger that James Stewart smuggled in the UK thinking it was a Yeti finger. So it's a very extraordinary human finger. And I, uh, <laughs> we thank Jimmy Stewart for his service to cryptozoology. Um, i got two more sections for you before I, before I, before I uh, stop talking here. First, I'll answer this question in case you're going to ask it. Is my favorite cryptid. Who is it? It's Mothman. It just is Mothman. This, this, this guy is growing in popularity. I've got four reasons for that, though. One is just his shape. I love the idea of an insectoid human flying around. Um, located in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, by the way. So I love this the idea of it. I love his story. Um, he actually has a story arc. Most cryptids don't. Most of their stories start um, teenagers in a car, in the back roads, um, after dark, glowing eyes. That's how they all start. And they almost all end with dot, 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 and the creature was never, ever seen again. Or that's where the dots come, at the end of that. So that's how every story, start, every story in cryptozoology is, mostly. Um, and the Mothman does start that way. It starts with teenagers in a car on the back roads outside of town, glowing eyes. Definitely starts that way. But it ends with a tragedy, with the collapse of the Silver Bridge, um, which spans Point Pleasant over into Ohio across the river. Um, first sighting of the Mothman was in at the end of 1966. And after a year of sightings of this creature, sightings basically stopped when this tragedy happened in December of 1967. 46 people died. It was a faulty eye beam. Um, it was Christmas time. The, the bridge was full of Christmas shoppers and it just collapsed under the weight, 46 people dead. And after that, Mothman wasn't seen as much. Now, naturally, the idea there is, this is a town of 4,000 people. Um, they have bigger things to think about. With 46 people dying, that touched a lot of people. They didn't need to talk, <laughs> they didn't need to think about insectoid humans flying around their skies. And the other idea there is maybe the Mothman was a harbinger. Like it came to kind of warn of this danger, uh, which is the plot of uh, the Mothman prophecies with Richard Gere, that movie. However, that just means it's a very bad harbinger because why would you send an insectoid human to tell us that a bridge is going to collapse in a year and it doesn't tell us that. So interestingly enough, that's kind of where the story ends. When you tell the story of the Mothman, you end, you almost always end at the Silver Bridge collapse. So I love it for, for its form. I love it for the story. I also love it for the celebration. Point Pleasant really owns the Mothman. This is my family wrapped around a stainless steel statue, an eight foot tall stainless steel statue of the Mothman that is not hidden away behind some eccentric business person's place of business. This thing is right downtown, proudly on display, um, has a Mothman Museum. They have a Mothman Festival uh, that 10,000 people come every September. This, this town of 4,000 grows to 10,000 every September and really gives their economy a giant boost. And remember I told you 24 cryptid festivals? I'd say half of them were inspired directly by the success of the Mothman Festival to start their own festival. Um, so I like it for the celebration. And the fourth reason I like the Mothman story the most because you can go hunt it. The Mothman was seen mostly in the TNT area outside of town. The TNT area was originally a, a munitions dump for world, during World War II, where these giant house-sized cement igloos, um, and they were just full of munitions. And then when World War II ended, uh, some companies kind of leased them and stored industrial waste, which might be an origin story for the Mothman. And then finally, just all overgrew in a forest. And today, it's a preserve. You can go out there. The cement structures are all still there. They're all kind of tangled in the forest, and you kind of have to like bushwhack a little bit for some of them. But they're, they're, you can go there after dark. It's full of graffiti. It feels dangerous. It feels like you're going to find the Mothman around every corner. And I love that. So if you're look, looking for Bigfoot, you kind of just walk out into a forest and you're like, I guess I'm, I guess this is Bigfoot's territory. But with Mothman, you know exactly where he was, where to find him um, if he exists. So I kind of like all those, all those elements of the story of the Mothman. And then finally, in closing, I'll answer this question as well. Do I believe in cryptids, right? So the, the, the really kind of weak answer, of course, is it depends on the cryptid, right? Some are more plausible than others. Ocean creatures are more plausible than the snallygaster or chicken octopus um, dragon thing. But I, I like to take a different tact on this question. Um, cryptids are real in other ways besides biologically, right? I just showed you how real cryptids can be to a town, how it can form their identity. So it's a real thing as a town's identity. Again, 
the people of Churubusco might not believe in the Beast of Busco, but they believe in the Beast of Busco, right? They, they believe in it as a way of identity, as a way of joining together as community, as a way of celebrating, as a way of doing things. So they really, it's a real thing to them, regardless of whether the turtle itself is real or not. Um, it's also real as a historical event. Unlike other areas of the paranormal, ghosts and, and UFOs maybe, when a cryptid was sighting, sighted, things happened. I call it hunting parties and parties, right? A hunting party is formed to go find it and people celebrate it. They party it. They, they throw parties around this thing. And, you know, always happens. Um, I've been writing nonfiction books for over a decade. And for the first time in my life with this book, more than 90% of my research was just local newspapers because they were chronicling these stories every day, every week, every month. So whether it was a hoax, whether somebody misidentified a creature, doesn't matter. It kicked off a moment of these town's histories, months long, a year long. In the case of Gloucester Sea Serpent, two years long, right? So these were real events, real events in history. Whether the creature itself was real or not, doesn't matter. The event itself actually happened and is documented in pretty good detail in local newspapers that then got turned to the national newspapers and then often with international as well. So in that way, cryptids are real as, as well. So the real is identities, they're real as historical um, uh, events. And finally, and this is really the tone of the book, they're real as symbols. I think of cryptids, um, they're even better as, as symbols of the natural world than as secrets of it. So when somebody says, I believe in Bigfoot, what I hear is hope and wonder, right? The two things we should all have. You know, you, you, you don't want the world to be, di to be done with secrets. Like it, it's just a barren wasteland of secrets. You want it to harbor surprises for us, moments of wonder for us. We don't want the entire world like zoned for, so known that we've zoned it all for McDonald's franchises, right? We want it to be a surprising place still, a place full of hope, a place full of wonder. So when I hear somebody say they believe in creatures like this, that's what I hear. They want to make sure the world is still diverse. They want the world to still be interesting. And that is really kind of a beautiful sentiment, um, even though it's wrapped around a hairy, furry, stinky beast like Bigfoot. Um, but that's it. That's what I got for you. Um, you want to know more about my books, my nonfiction, my weird travels? Oddthingsiveseen.com, as Jeff said, is, is my hub. I've got plenty of books, plenty of free articles of my travels searching for the weird that go beyond cryptid towns and go to cursed objects and anything can find that stands out as <laughs> more interesting than ordinary life. And with that, Jeff, I will relinquish control here if I can. Stop share. Okay. Um, thank you for that great presentation. Um, so if anybody has any questions, they can put it in the chat. Yeah, or feel free to unmute if you want to ask me any questions. I definitely yeah. love talking about cryptids and... Um, I had to take like three sections out of this presentation to squeeze it to 45 minutes because I could probably keep talking for another hour. And no questions is fine too. We'll just be awkward for a few moments until everybody goes home, I think. <laughs> so. Um, well, um, I have a question. Uh, what was your favorite part in researching for the book? It... Travel. I'm always up for travel. For me, like a, a nonfiction book is just an excuse to travel, right? Um, like I always say that the book itself is the cherry on top of the experience, but being able to travel and meet people, I make friends with these books, right? I, the people I interview, I end up staying, you know, being friends with. Um, that is kind of the entire fun for me. Uh, but I will say like looking in local newspapers, uh, if you don't have a subscription to newspapers.com, by the way, and it, you should get one, even if you're not writing a book, the, the trove of local newspapers is just fascinating to see what people wrote about, what people were doing, what people thought was newsworthy, you know, back in the early 1900s, back in the 70s. Um, generally, the golden era of cryptids was 1950s to 1970s. And you go back in, into the newspaper archives of any town during that time, you'll find something weird that they reported on on a daily basis. Oh, so we do have some questions. Um... Do you still have your podcast and will you feature any cryptids from Alicia? I do have my podcast. I haven't warmed it up. It's been uh, kind of um, on hiatus for about a year. I do want to warm it up, especially for cryptids, because what I did was I have tons of photos from my journeys that didn't, the book isn't a photo book. It's all illustrations. So I have all these foot photos, as you saw from that Mothman slide, of my adventures looking for cryptids and looking for statues and festivals, and all this kind of thing. And I would love to tell some of those stories on the podcast and then link to pictures on the website. So it's, it's, it's something I really want to do if I can just clear up space to like sit in front of a microphone I, uh, and <laughs> when I'm not asked to by myself without people around me like you guys are. Phil says, 
Um, what was your biggest surprise in your research aside from the plethora of Bigfoot? I would say the opposite of that. So the plethora of Bigfoot was a surprise and then the, or the converse of that, I should say. Um, the plethora of types of creatures. There are, you know, you think you'd run out really fast, right? There's only like you know, five types, what are five genuses or whatever branch of the trees. But man, the number of creatures out there is surprising. I mean, there's a giant flying clam in Nevada. There is like um, a, a short, small uh, ET-like creature in New Hampshire called the Dairy Fairy. There were, there's, I, I could probably, in fact, I think I kicked out 10 other, so I think I have 71 creatures in the book. I kicked out 10 um, just for space. And then I kicked out another 20 because the stories weren't thick enough for me to write about, but these creatures were amazing. There's like, we just, it's, am it's amazing what variety we can have of animals. And we know this in real life, right? With, bio with actual zoology, the number of the variety of animals is crazy, but in the world of cryptids, you'd think there'd be some ruts. <laughs> there isn't. It's almost as, as uh, vib vibrant as um, uh, established zoology. Uh, Michelle asks, any cryptids that are common in Connecticut? So the New England, I will say, the New England states are pretty cryptid impoverished. <laughs> um, but with the exception, maybe Massachusetts. Massachusetts gets everything, I guess. Um, I'm trying to remember, I did have a cryptid in Connecticut. Um, and I don't, I don't have my book in front of me, otherwise I pick it up. There is, there is, Connecticut is definitely represented. All 50 states are represented. Connecticut has at least one. Um, but it escapes my mind which one it is off top. I should have looked it up. I knew this was a Bridgeport talk. I should have looked it up before I came here. But there is there is cryptic Connecticut, Connecticut cryptids. In addition, you guys still have Bigfoot and Lake and Lake Monsters. Those are omnipresent in every state. Kara says, thanks for this talk. Fascinating work. Um, Jennifer says, other than Point Pleasant, what other towns have a huge investment in their monster? Yep. So I mentioned Rylander. I told you guys about that. Uh, Whitehall, New York uh, is obsessed with its Bigfoot. You go down there and there's these giant metal Bigfoot statues throughout the town, probably four or five. These are big. These are giant works of art. They're pretty amazing. They're worth going. Again, you'll never go to Whitehall, New York on your own, but you'll definitely want to go for these statues. So Whitehall, New York has done it. Um, China Flats is another Bigfoot town. I, this is the one that's, that where Bigfoot was originally found. Statues everywhere. They have murals on every store. They are themed Bigfoot. Um, uh, Norfolk, um, Virginia is obsessed with mermaids. So this is an example of a town that just picked one out of thin air. So Norfolk is on the coast of Virginia and uh, mostly it's a city actually. It's actually an actual city and mostly known for its naval base there. But once upon a time, a couple of decades ago, they're like, we need something to actually wrap our identity around. And they picked mermaids. They were a nautical town, more or less. They had a Navy base, they were on the coast, but no sightings of mermaids. There's no mermaids in their history. They just like the idea of mer women, of female mermaids. And now it's the mermaid capital of the United States. There are mermaids everywhere. Um, there's a town I, There's a town where they're obsessed with um, gnomes. I, I, uh, Dawson, Minnesota. You go there and there's gnomes all over the place. And each gnome represents a person in the town that's being honored with their own gnome. It's a doctor or it's a lawyer, or it's a basketball coach. And they just, you go downtown and it's the main strip is just full of garden gnomes. So, um, custom garden gnomes. These things are like three, four feet tall. Sometimes they're 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 designed to look like <laughs> their their real life counterpart. So they're they're all over the place. You'll you'll be surprised how many how many towns are monster themed. Um, Loacus. So go. So thank you, Catherine. <laughs> the Gloacus is um is my Connecticut um um cryptid, which is like uh, I think it's like a like half cat, half dog that um. <laughs> terrorize the people of Glastonbury for a few few months. Um, yeah, and uh, I forget there was, oh, Alicia also asked, are there any uh, plant equivalents or microscopic cryptid, cryptids? You know what? I didn't come across, you'd think there'd be some kind of like um, um, carnivorous plant, right? Carnivorous plant cryptid. I didn't come across any plants or microscopic cryptids, um, but that's probably the next, that's probably the next phase, right? Once we kind of, you know, after, after so many decades or hundreds or centuries, at some point we have to say, okay, there's no Bigfoot at least anymore, or there's no Snallygaster at least anymore. At some point you have to just kind of admit that, but why not move to the microscopic realm? You know, there's, there's gotta be some kind of like um, um, evolution to that. I can definitely see that happening. I love, love that concept actually. We got, um... Thank yous from Michelle and Ursula um, and Phil. Um, see, um, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned some movies. Do you have a favorite cryptid themed movie? 
So I think it's probably the same the same story as the same as my cryptid, right? So Mothman Prophecies um, is a major Hollywood picture starring Richard Gere. Um, it's based on the book, The Mothman Prophecies from Jonathan Keel. So Jonathan Keel was the journalist. He was a, a New York journalist, a Manhattan journalist who heard about the goings on in Point Pleasant and went there himself during that year. And he embedded himself there. And most of the stories we know from Point Pleasant, the Mothman sightings were from his book. And if you read his book, it is a mind trip. It is... Um, it is technically nonfiction. It's his account of his time in Point Pleasant investigating and being involved. The number of weird stuff beyond flying insectoids, there's like uh, tiny people walking around, there's ghosts, there's demons, there's inter inter interdimensional creatures. It, the, 1967, 1966, 1967 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia was a science experiment from aliens or something because it, it's crazy. And then they took that book and they kind of like normalized it down into the Mothman prophecies with Richard Gere in which um, they kind of treat that harbinger idea that the Mothman is a, a harbinger, a kind of international, interdimensional creature that's a harbinger of the, the bridge tragedy is kind of the storyline they take. Uh, it's very moody. It's very kind of like the X-Files uh, in tone, I'd say, uh, in, movie, in movie form. So that's probably one of my favorites. And I've watched that probably more than any other crypto movie. Uh, don't see any more questions. All right, I think we have extinguished the uh, the, the font of curiosity <laughs> around cryptids. <laughs> oh, there's no more. Yeah, I just say if, if you guys are interested, the books out there, it's in all bookstores, libraries. You know, get definitely get them from libraries if you can. I'm really a big fan of that, especially since we're doing this for a library. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all about monsters and the towns that celebrate them. So, um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, JW, for a great presentation. Um, and, um, please check our social media for upcoming events. Um, uh, we have the, um, I have an author talk with Jonathan Abrams about his new book, uh, The Come Up, an oral history of the rise of hip hop on December 6th. Um, so please check that out and please check out JW's book and have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.